recall a time when you were, giving a, you were given a warning and then for whatever reason, you just chose to ignore the warning? Um, maybe, maybe it was uh, when you went to the beach and there was a red flag and you're like, ah, I'm going to get in the water anyway. I mean, you know, we've probably all done something like that before where there was a warning and we saw it, it was clear, but we made a choice just to ignore it anyway. We've even seen some of this uh, in the past several weeks. Maybe it was some folks that went to the ocean when they weren't supposed to uh, during this coronavirus thing when the beaches were closed or even when they were open and there was discouragement of everybody getting together and being such in close proximity. Um, many have chosen to ignore any social distancing warnings that have been given as of late. And, and whether or not you went to the beach, you probably could confess to a time where you heard someone offer advice, but you chose to be stubborn and do what you wanted to do. In fact, right now, I am sure that there are husbands and wives sitting next to each other on a couch somewhere, streaming through the service, and the wife is elbowing their husband over the stubbornness that he has given. Gentlemen, join the club, right? So uh, I, I simply want us to illustrate this, that we have all had these moments of stubbornness where we heard something and we didn't listen to it, and we didn't heed the advice. Today, as we study Acts chapter 28, verses 17 through 29, we're going to notice the danger and the likelihood of ignoring a very important message. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up, if you would, to Acts chapter 28. Uh, we're going to read verses 17 through 29 today as we learn, because I believe that God has a word for us today. So if you're taking notes, which I strongly encourage you to do, the first blank that you can fill out in the listening guide or just write down this word. It's the idea of distancing that we see here in the text. Let's read verses 17 through 22 today. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because, of the, Jews, because, uh, but because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to bring against my nation. Excuse me. Uh, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you. Since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letter from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Now, if you are joining us for the first time in a long time, or perhaps you, you dialed in and tuned in last week, Easter Sunday. Welcome back. We're so glad you're here. We're jumping right back into our series that we've been going on for a really long time uh, through the book of Acts. And here we are in the last chapter, the last section of Acts. In fact, we'll wrap up this sermon series in its totality next week. But for, for those of you who are kind of just jumping in, Paul, here in these few verses, has kind of summarized the last several chapters as he has journeyed to Rome and why he has gotten to this place. But what I think is interesting, when he finds himself here, we get some insight into the ancient relationship that existed between Jews and Christians. But also, as we unpack this, it's going to force us to consider how even there is a distance of modern-day Christianity in this perceived relationship to the world. You know, every year, uh, the Oxford Dictionary and a lot of other places do this, will kind of promote or broadcast what the word of the year is. And so when we entered in uh, 2009, when we ended 2019, the Oxford Dictionary said that climate emergency was the word of the year for 2019. In 2018, it was the word toxic. I'm going to go ahead and make a prediction that when we end 2020, the word of the year is going to be social distancing. That is part of our vocabulary that was never part of it before. And I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and make the prediction that that will be Oxford Dictionary's word of the year. Now, if I get it wrong, 
it doesn't really matter because I don't like the word anyway. Yet, here's why it's important. We're seeing here when we read these verses together that there seems to be for the Jews in, of, in Rome in Paul's time that there was some perceived distance that they had not given information or received information. Now, uh, Christianity was not a new thing to Rome. In fact, if you go all the way back to Acts chapter 2, specifically in verse 10, when you read of the time at the Pentecost, we see that there were Christians that came there from Rome. So Christianity in Rome was not a new thing at all. But if we want to connect a few dots today, what we see here in Acts chapter 28 is some perceived level of distancing between the Jews and the Christians there in Rome. And it is likely that this is a result of an edict that came from Claudius. And we read about it all the way back in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And you can read about this in history because there was so much friction and fighting in Rome between the Jews and the Christians. Claudius had just dispelled all of the Jews. This had happened about 10 years prior to this point. Now they've been able to kind of reacclimate back into society, but you can kind of perceive there's a, there's a little bit of of hesitancy to fully engage between the Jews and Christians in Rome. And it's likely, not with absolute certainty, but likely this is a result of this edict that happened 10 years prior that we read about in Acts chapter 18. Uh, maybe some, some scholars would believe that maybe this was out of fear for further enforcement. Uh, and and the, the Jews during Paul's day, were, they were just less aware of the Christian influence around them due to a level of social distancing, if you would. And so uh, maybe the Jews were just being the model of diplomacy, maintaining as much distance as possible from this whole matter of Paul. In any event, uh, their refusal to speak anything against Paul was in and of itself something of an indirect testimony to his innocence. Um, here, here's why I even bring this up today. Uh, you and I should be alarmed when we look at this, this distance between the awareness of Christianity and Jews in ancient Rome, and we compare this to our world today, you, you and I should be alarmed that there are mixed opinions about Christianity today, largely evidenced by a level of ongoing social distancing from culture. And my prayer is that this is one thing that a sweeping revival may change, but let's just look at what we know for now. Uh, it was interesting, Barnard Research Group did a study where they compared uh, Christians' views of themselves in 1993 to 2018. And they wanted to measure how we as Christians even viewed uh, life, our world, and our faith in 93 versus today. And here's what was interesting. In 1993, 89% of Christians uh, who had shared their faith, they agreed that it was the responsibility of every Christian to do so. In 2018, only 64% of Christians, that's a 25% drop agreed that it was their responsibility to share their faith. What, what an interesting, when we compare this time stamp of 1993 to 2018, uh, personally, I'm, I'm discouraged that in 93, there were 11% of Christians who believed that I shouldn't have this responsibility. But the fact that it's dropped from 89% to 64% in that time stamp is discouraging. Let me show you another statistic, though. Uh, in 2019, LifeWay Research did a study. Here's a graph of, of some of this research, and you can, you can investigate this on your own and, and drill down more into the data if you'd like. But according to LifeWay Research in, in 2019, 62% of professing Christians don't even think others know that they are a believer. And 69% of professing Christians don't believe that all of who they are should be under the authority of God. Let that sink in just for a minute. That this is rounded up. 70% of professing believers, at least of those who participated in this research study, think that God doesn't need to have control of all of their life. That 62% that of them would say, I don't even think my friends know that I'm a Christian. Church, listen to me. It is time to break the silence. The time is now. 
to break the silence. We cannot allow ourselves to be lulled to sleep and to settle into it being okay that the world doesn't know who Jesus is, that the world doesn't know that I have professed him as my Lord and Savior. Do my neighbors know? Do my neighbor's neighbors know? Do everybody that I come in contact know that Jesus is my Lord? And do, am I fully surrendering all of my life to him? It is time to break the silence. Paul even wrote to the Roman church prior to his arrival. He wrote them a letter in advance of his coming. And he said in Romans chapter 1, verses 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Church, listen, lean in carefully. I believe this. We are on the doorstep of another great awakening. And what we and Jesus' church do right now will echo for generations. Our church should, should forever be different as a result of this time stamp in which we are living right now. We should never be the same. We need to be careful that we do not allow ourselves to be lulled into sleep, to sleep to say, I want the world to go back to just the way it was in January of 2020. I want a new day. I want a great awakening. I want revival. I want my heart, this church, this city, and this world to forever be changed for the sake of the gospel. And it is time to break the silence. We need 100% of Christians to walk under the full authority of God. We need 100% of Christians in this church to say, I want to make sure that everybody that I know is fully aware that Jesus has ultimate control of my life and Jesus can change their life forever. We're going to talk a little bit more about this at the end of our service. Pastor Frank's going to give you some information on, on one simple way that we're going to try to equip you to communicate and at least open the doorway of conversation to your neighbor. You can visit later, not right now because it may disrupt the stream, calvaryga.com forward slash sign, where we're trying to equip you to love your neighbors, share your neighbor, and even through your faithful generosity, be able to provide food and hope and help during the season, not solely because we want to, to give food away, but we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus and allow that tangible expression of care and love open the doorway to say, this is why I'm giving you food. This is why I'm caring for you as my neighbor. This is why I'm calling to check on you because I love you because Christ loves me and Christ loves you as well. And we need to understand this morning, we live in a world of discipline distancing, but boldness in our faith will lead us to make a declaration. This is the second point of the day, if you're taking notes. We're going to read of it in verses 23 and 24. Paul makes a bold declaration. Let's read together verse 23 and 24. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. If you had important news to share, what would you do? Would you be this guy? Would you, would you jump through like a, like a town crier that we may see uh, in, in, in Great Britain? Would, you, would this be the way that you would dress if you had an announcement to make? Probably not. Instead, likely what you would do is you would proclaim this announcement through social media. Uh, if, we, if we were under a stay-at-home order, you may do it over lunch or by the water cooler at work. But in these days, it may be picking up the phone and calling somebody. To say, listen, I've got great news and you need to hear it. I need to celebrate with you. I need to share with you. I need to show you something spectacular. And so Paul, he sits here with these uh, Jewish men, these believers in Rome, and, and they come together and they begin to hear what he has to say. Paul took every advantage to be a crier for Jesus. And, and what is the sum of his sermon? It, his... 
his sermon was like rinse, recycle, repeat. Everywhere he preached, it was basically the same message, that, that there is no one who is righteous and saved from his own works and efforts. Rather, our righteousness and salvation comes from faith in Jesus. And, and this, his sermon was not a new teaching, freshly contrived today. Rather, it is the first and the most ancient sermon and teaching that we've ever had on earth. It began all the way back in the Garden of Eden when God said to the snake, I will make enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and her seed will crush your head. That was the first glimpse of the gospel message and the truth of hope and redemption and this great rescue mission that God would send his son Jesus to come to this earth, absorb the wrath that you and I fully are earned. And this same message should be on our lips today. But here in verse 24, we have listeners who refuse to believe. And I would say today, we have listeners all around us, perhaps even some of you watching this sermon today online, who refuse to listen. And I think it begs an important question that we need to consider today. Why does the gospel of Christ experience such opposition? Uh, we could probably have a, a whole conference for weeks discussing this. I want to propose two reasons, and there could be more. Here's the one, one reason. We have a real enemy. Go ahead and write that down. We need to understand we have a real enemy. Satan, the prince of this world, he rules in it with absolute pride, with greed, indecency, hatred, drunkenness, murder, and similar perversions and vices. And now Christ enters the world with the gospel. His kingdom destroys the devil. For in the place of pride in the gospel, it teaches humility. In the place of greed, it offers gentleness. In the place of indecency, chastity. And in the place of wrath and hatred, it offers friendliness. Totally contradictory to the world that the real enemy Satan, the devil, wants to cause us to believe. And this, the devil, he can't tolerate. He, therefore, he instigates the entire world to be at war against Christ and his word. But he's incapable of accomplishing anything. Because if he were in a game of chess, he's already in checkmate. He's already been conquered. He's already been defeated. But for you and I, on this earth, navigating the pains and the realities of every 24-hour day in which we live, we need to understand we have a real enemy at war against us. We're reminded in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We have a real enemy. And certainly that is a factor in why there is so much opposition to the truth of God's word and the hope of the gospel. And as that fleshes out in my life and in yours, there is a second factor I would love for you to consider today. You could write this down. It's the, the idea of false pride. See, being born with the nature of sin, of ego and arrogance and independence, rebellion, how we started this whole conversation today, of hearing a warning and this choosing to go the opposite way, we realize that in our world, uh, through piety, through uh, righteousness, works and efforts, even some believe that's the way they could be made right with God. But then the gospel comes and it teaches contrary to this. That, that human righteousness and piety and works and efforts cannot stand before God's judgment. Rather, whoever wants to be saved through faith must clasp onto Jesus put their trust in the Son of God and cling tightly to His Word and dive into it. And this the world can't tolerate. It's willing neither to see nor to hear such preaching. It revolts and rages and raves against Christ and His Word. But they're already conquered by Christ. Uh, let, me, let me read for you, if I may, James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Hear this, church. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. 
Let your laughter be torn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. God is calling you today for you to humble yourself and put your trust in him. In the words of an ancient sermon that was preached by John the Baptist, that was preached by Christ, that was preached by Paul, I preach it today, and it is simply this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. We, we just read these verses in James chapter 4 that, that causes me to develop in my mindset a perspective toward my sin and realize that it breaks the heart of God and hate it that humble myself before him and put my trust in him. And even, even in this bold declaration that Paul preached to them this day, and he went on and on about it. We read uh, from morning until evening. It was an all-day sermon. Thankfully, you don't have to tolerate me talking that long. But even in this bold declaration of truth by Paul, they wouldn't listen. And we see now in the, in the following verses, verses 25 through 27, a spirit of deafness that falls. Let's read together. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. This was the, the straw that broke the camel's back for them, so to speak. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, and he's going to quote here from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Let me explain it to you this way. Uh, have you ever had that realization that when you look into the mirror, maybe as a middle-aged man, and realize that you look just like your dad? Uh, that's not fun. In, in essence, what Paul is accusing them of when he's quoting uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 to, to these Jews in Rome is that they are as stubborn and as hard-headed as their forefathers had been. And, and before Paul left, he, he uttered this one final word. He claimed that the Holy Spirit had truly spoken to them through the words which Isaiah had originally addressed to their ancestors. And it was a case of like father, like children. And this quotation was one which was very familiar to the early church. It had even been used by Jesus in Luke chapter 8 verse 10 and Matthew chapter 13 and Mark chapter 4. Paul himself had used it when he wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 11, verse 8. This beware and weary of the fact that you don't reject the truth just like your fathers before you have done. But it's time now to listen. But just like in the past, due to their stubbornness, they were deaf to the truth. Uh, let's look at stubbornness this way. Okay, let's, let's try to contextualize this idea of stubbornness perhaps in a way that we can, we can kind of hang some truth to. Uh, let, me, let me speak to the married couples in the room. Can I say that today? If you were asked to name three areas where you and your spouse disagree, you, you likely could do it without even having to think very hard. And in fact, you might even be able to produce a top 10 list uh, if you were to take a few more minutes. And sadly, in your household, in your marriage, unless someone at your house starts doing some giving in, those same issues are going to keep popping up between you and your spouse day after day, year after year. And unless someone kind of relents and does some giving in, those, those three or 10 or however many issues that are an issue for you today will be an issue for you 10, 15, or 20 years from now. And there's only one way to get beyond this stubborn stalemate such as these. It's by finding uh, a word that's the opposite of stubbornness, and it's the word of willingness. See, in an attitude and a spirit of cooperation that, that should really permeate our conversation, it's like a palm tree by the ocean that endures the greatest winds because it's gracefully willingness to bend. And in order for us to 
push through stubbornness, it takes a spirit of willingness on our heart. And in fact, I would, I would submit to you, if you read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, you see that Jesus was one of the best examples of humility and willingness that we ever can see. And he willingly came to the earth. He willingly humbled himself even to the point of death. And Paul has spoken the truth to the Roman Jews, and he speaks with conviction to their stubbornness, pointing out their tendency to be deaf to the truth. And like the Jews in this instance, God calls men today, calls you to repent, to turn, to listen, and to be changed. Sinner, can you hear the word of the Lord today? Church, Can you hear the word of the Lord today? In these verses, five different times the word for hear is used. It's as if he's urging them to listen up, pay attention, dial in, tune in, focus to what I'm saying. Listen. And listen, I'm I'm not a gloom and doom preacher. Okay, You You don't have to listen to me very long over many weeks to know that I'm not a doom and gloom kind of preacher. But I will say this, I certainly believe with all of my heart that what we are observing right now in this world is a sign of the times. And we need to wake up. Jesus is coming. Repent. But even now, many will not listen. This was not a problem that was exclusive to ancient Romans. Uh, It was written of elsewhere in the New Testament. In fact, read with me, if you would, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. You'll see Paul even urging his protege, Timothy, to be aware of this tendency. He says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will uh, accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Dial into verse 4. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. When the truth is declared, many will respond with deafness. Some will respond out of desire. Let's read the next few verses if we may. Verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And when he had spoken these words, the Jews departed having a great dispute among themselves. Now, time out real quick. Um, Kind of a side note lesson, if I may, just for the fun of it. Uh, Verse 29 there, we just read on the screen, is in brackets. And depending on what translation in the Bible you're using at home, Some of you may have had a 29. Some of you may not have had a 29. In fact, your 29 may have been really small script in the very bottom of that page where it says some manuscripts have this verse. And so this is just a moment. Let me pause. This is really a conversation of textual criticism. Um, But you'll find some translations that would give you verse 29. And that's because in the Latin Vulgate and a couple other manuscripts, there was this uh, there was this verse that was given there, and it was, op- it was really adopted by the Byzantine text. Uh, but, but in a lot, in fact, the overwhelming majority of Greek manuscripts that we have, that verse 29 is not there. And so that's why uh, some translations will spell it out because it was in the Latin Vulgate. Some translations will put it down in the bottom because uh, most manuscripts don't have it, but some do. So we're just trying to acknowledge it. So all that being said, don't get mad at that. Just... It's there because of the way that we're trying to draw together all these different manuscripts. And the reality of it is, uh, verse 29 is really just repeating what was given in verse 27, okay? Um, So here's what we need to pay attention to. We we see in verse 27, there is a promise of healing if 
they will repent, which is that word that means to make a change, to turn from. In the Gentiles, they were more likely to hear. They would listen. They would, they would be respect, uh, receptive and responsive in their hearts. The Jews, they, truth, they expressed their desire to hear Paul. But when they heard the truth of his message of hope in the gospel, their hearts were hardened. Many of them were hardened, and they really did not even hear his word of salvation. But the Gentiles, it would be different. They would hear. They would respond. And I think the beauty of this is Acts in its whole, we're getting here to the end of it. And Acts in its whole story is this message of inclusion within the gospel, that the gospel is sent, salvation is sent for all, not just for Jews, this one group of people, but for the whole world to hear the truth. This is a glimpse into the heart of God and the expanse of his love. Let me read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. It says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And this is true today for you. For you today, God offers you healing. He offers you hope. God offers you a fresh start. God offers you a fresh start today. If you'll listen, if you'll hear the hope and the truth of the gospel. The reality that God created man and he created you to be in relationship with him. But the truth, the reality is, we've got a problem of sin that separates us from God. And we just read several verses back of of, uh, the, the danger of that and the heartbreak that that should cause in our heart. That we should be broken over the fact that, that we've hurt God, we've offended God, our sins have separated us from God, and we need to push back against this false pride that we addressed at the very beginning and the first point of our sermon today, and realizing that, that there is no amount of work or good deeds or service that I can do. I can't, I can't love enough, give enough. My good deeds can't take care of this sin problem. In fact, my sins, the reality of my existence, being born into sin into this world, it deserves the full wrath of death and separation forever from God. But God, being rich in love, full of grace, mercy and truth, sent his son Jesus to come to this earth who paid the price for my sin fully. He died. He rose again. He finished it. We celebrated that on Good Friday. We talked about it last Sunday on Easter. And everyone... No matter where you come from in this earth, no matter what continent you live on, everyone who puts their trust in him will have life. And yes, that is hope in heaven for eternity, but that is the joy and peace of his presence now on this earth, having a reason to live every day. I I don't know that I can say it any more clearly than that. And the call is simple. Repent. Turn from your sin. Put your trust in Jesus. Hear the truth today. For those of you that are here within the sound of my voice are able to see this screen. We're coming to a point in our service where we're going to challenge everybody to take a step of faith today. And regardless of, of where you are coming into this conversation, it may influence where you go next. Uh, There may be some of you that are uh, listening today and watching this service, and you're realizing today the fullness of the gospel and the desire for God to have a relationship with you. But like the Jews that we read of here in Acts chapter 28, for years you have been deaf to it. You, You acknowledge that your heart has been hardened by it. But today, through the beauty and the grace of God, your heart is becoming open. And I beg of you to listen. Don't put up another blockade. Don't distance yourself further. Don't fall on deaf ears. 
But put your trust in Jesus today. A simple conversation between you and God where you confess or agree and admit that you believe that God sent his son Jesus to die for you. You understand that you have sin that is separated from you from God and you are thankful and you believe with all of your heart that he sent his son to die for you and he rose from the dead and you choose to give him full authority of your life and put your trust in him today. My prayer is that some of you today will repent and put your trust in Jesus. Many of you, I pray most of you who are watching today, even those that are a part of our church, you, you've made that, that exchange of your soul years ago and you're following with him. I really want you and I together to commit to be bold in proclaiming to the world that Jesus offers hope. We are living in a day like none of us experienced in our lifetime where the world is so much more receptive and ready to hear the truth and it is time to break the silence. We cannot allow ourselves to be part of that statistics that we read like in LifeWay and Barner Research earlier this morning. You and I must be faithful to live under the full authority of God and make sure that 100% of the people that we know hear and understand that we follow Jesus and he can offer them hope. We're going to commit to boldly proclaim to the world that Jesus offers hope. And we will see, I pray that we will see this great awakening in our world today, in our city and in our church. Maybe there's some of you today that you need to confess there's a level of stubbornness. As you hear the truth, maybe, maybe it applies to some of what we said today, perhaps in general. You're just uh, you, you have operated with an attitude of stubbornness of rejecting any level of truth that comes from God and His Word. And, and I pray that whatever it is, that that barrier would be broken in your life and you would commit and choose to listen to the Holy Spirit prompting you every single day. Whatever your next step is today, I pray that you would listen and that you would respond however the Lord leads you. 